I'm, I'm very happy to introduce uh, one of my good friends, um, Mike Wallenack, uh, working for City of Arlington. He's been there over 17 years. Uh, if anybody knows stormwater and MPDS and science and, and water and reclaimed water and all that, it's, it's Mike Wallenack. Um, his responsibilities at the city in, include special projects for water, wastewater, stormwater utilities. Um, he's always seeking opportunities to integrate water resources management wherever possible, where it comes in and where it goes back out, uh, making sure it's clean. Um, water conservation, uh, watershed and wellhead protection programs, uh, regulatory compliance. Um, he, do, he, does, he does it all. Um, prior to joining Arlington, uh, Mike worked for nine years in environmental consulting and eight years with the Forest Service in Southeast Alaska. So he's done a lot of traveling. He's been married to his wife, April, a uh, uh, nurse practitioner for over 25 years, and they have three sons, and they're very busy sons, but they're, they're all a pleasure. I know all, all three of those boys, and they're, they're great young men. And uh, uh, Mike and April have also volunteered in drinking water and health programs in underdeveloped countries, having drilled wells and conducted health education programs in remote villages in Siberia, Africa, and Central America. And, and I hope you really all enjoy this project. It's a lot of innovation, and Mike's a pleasure to work with. And I think he's a resource that you can go to anytime after this presentation. So, Mike, I'm going to turn it over to you. All right. Thank you, Bill. I'm going to ask one time only uh, if you can see and hear me because I am I, I have plenty of audio but I'm flying blind. Yes, yes. I can see. Yeah, I can see my I got my I got my uh, presentation. That's all I need. Thanks yep, so much for you, yeah. Thanks so much for the opportunity to present today. Um, titled this using a constructed wetland to integrate water resources management. Uh, because I want to talk about a lot of stuff. This parcel of land is in the um, north end of Arlington. Arlington is in northern Snohomish County uh, in the center of the Stillaguamish Basin. We've got the Skagit River to the north, Snohomish to the south. I understand I'm speaking to the entire state, so I'm giving a, uh, a, uh, a fairly broad overview about vicinity, et cetera. Um, the Stillaguamish is the fifth largest basin uh, draining to Puget Sound. Uh, basically, the North Fork goes from Darrington down to the confluence at Arlington, uh, South Fork from above Granite Falls down to the confluence, and then the channel bifurcates and discharges both the South Skagit and Port Susan. Now, if you could hover above the ground there at that arrowhead, you would see something that looks like this. There's the city of Arlington, North End. There's the confluence of the river going to the west, to the right. Uh, you'll see intersection of Highway 530 and 9 in Allen Park. And you are able to see my cursor, is that correct? Yes, we can see your cursor. Thank you so much. So, but um, this is, my office is right here. Come visit. So uh, we have a utilities complex and an adjacent wetland, and that's going to be the focus of our conversation today. So I'm going to do a little bit of storytelling, jump back uh, 140 years or so, and um, 130 years, and you'll see a general store was established here. A couple of uh, Scandinavian friends, Nils and Nels, came upriver from uh, from uh, Stanwood, and there was also a Stillaguamish tribal camp here at this location, but they established a general store for pioneers and, and river travelers um, uh, right on the bank, pretty much the exact center of that circle still, I believe, anyway. They uh, had a dug a depression for seepage for water supply uh, and the river Basically, riverbank filtration would seep in there and they would use that for their water supply. With development came uh, and forestry came uh, shingle mills. At one point, uh, Arlington in that area was the shingle capital of the world. The shallow well was deepened uh, to serve the shingle mills, steam power. And the uh, 1903, the towns of Haller and Arlington were both uh, platted. With the uh, coming of the North Pacific Railroad in the late 1800s, eventually the um, uh, 
the battle between Arlington and Haller went to Arlington, which is where the depot went. And then with the development of Arlington, that well, it's the very same one, was first used in the, actually in the teens and then in the 20s uh, for a water supply in that vicinity. Uh, in the 23 or 24, a water treatment plant was uh, constructed and um, mains were installed to start serving the city uh, using septics and privies for wastewater. 1930s, you had your initial um, sewer system. It had a combined sewer and storm uh, manholes and, and truck line that discharged directly untreated to the river. In the 1950s, Arlington was one of the first uh, municipalities that uh, constructed primary wastewater treatment works. Um, they basically installed mains to the to the treatment plant and created a wastewater outfall. The original trunk line sewer then treated untreated stormwater um, through the same original outfall. And there you see it was uh, dump no waste, drains to stream. Okay, fast forward to 2010. There are a couple of other improvements to our wastewater plant. We upgraded and expanded the treatment plant to become a reclamation facility. So instead of producing wastewater effluent, we were producing reclaim, reclaimed water. Um, high quality uh, treated water that had the potential there for additional reuse. Still, as of 2010, thereabouts, our stormwater is still going to the river untreated. And starting 2010 2011, we constructed a treatment wetland initially primarily for stormwater, constructed, uh, consists of four cells. And it provided treatment to uh, previously untreated stormwater. And then here you can see the original um, bypass line was just saved as a bypass for maintenance, but basically all stormwater then went through this treatment system. Uh, about the same time, we installed a reclaimed water bypass line or, or uh, second discharge, if you will, from the wastewater plant, the water reclamation facility, continued to discharge to the river, but also gave us the opportunity to send it to the wetland. Similarly, um, uh, water treatment plant backwash, which is uh, necessary, it's a waste created uh, through maintenance of the wastewater, or water facility, excuse me, um, we were able to construct a line to discharge um, the high quality fraction of that waste to the wetland as well. So at this point then, present condition, we have three utilities, water, wastewater or water reclamation, and stormwater. And you see these three different systems. I wanted to tell you this story because you see three different things and with the construction of this wetland, I want to show you how uh, we started integrating and using um, one utility to benefit the other. So all three utilities have uh, benefits. They're all interrelated now, and they're, they work together to help with our um, water resources management in the city. And that's what this schematic is showing. Yes, three separate utilities up into about 2011. This wetland comes in, there are a lot of other things that went on also, but the wetland coming in and being constructed tied a lot of this together and, and gave us a lot more um, benefits, a lot more opportunities that we would not have had without it. So that's where we're gonna start talking today is give you a quick overview of that wetland. Um, we uh, established a project uh, to develop a constructed treatment wetland that would have sufficient hydraulic conductivity to accommodate a 100-year storm event in the north end of Arlington, Old Town Arlington. In addition, we wanted to be able to accommodate discharge from the reclamation facility 
at full build out, which is uh, we're right now we're about half, just under half of that. So about two, 1.5 to two MGD. The wetland would be able to uh, adequately treat stormwater runoff and mitigate nutrient and temperature effects from the rec uh, reclamation facility. And here is a uh, design phase. So we have four cells in this wetland. First cell, um, second cell, and we'll talk about these, uh, third cell, fourth. So we have some settling, we have an emergent wetland, we have a forested wetland, and we have a, a riffle, a forested riffle, if you will, small stream. Oops, I'm gonna go back. We wanted the wetland to provide an aesthetic park like. We had a lot of playgrounds and parks in the city, but none that provided a good open space atmosphere. And so when we did some uh, public outreach trying to determine uh, the best approach for our project, uh, we heard that we wanted uh, trails and habitat and wildlife viewing areas. So that's part of what we did. And then fourthly, we provide we want to provide educational opportunities um, for our education and outreach program, our stormwater PEO programs. So cell one basically mimics a, a pond or a lacustrian aquatic system. It uh, is about a half acre in size. It's long linear. You can see in this photo. 35,000 cubic feet. The primary objective for this cell is to anything that is settleable or floatable, we want to take it out. So um, settleable solids, the coarse sediments and any of the nutrients and debris and oils and stuff that might be attached to the sediments are going to fall out in this first cell. Any uh, garbage, cigarette butts, floating debris uh, has the opportunity to be skimmed off the top. Um, oils also, uh, you don't see it in here, but we did put in a, a oil boom across the inlet to this first cell. Key feature, and this is, you're seeing this uh, with no vegetation after, shortly after construction, but um, we wanted it to be dredged. We know that this is gonna be something that's gonna have to happen periodically. So we've planted, you'll see on the uh, south and east bank, if you will, and on this bank, on the northern bank, it's, it's got vegetation for sure, but it's of a nature that can be um, can be accommodated for, you know, you can get an excavator in there, a small excavator to go ahead and, and dredge. Um, uh, we have both uh, some uh, emergent plants along the, and, and shrubs along the edges, but it's primarily um, a little bit of shading uh, because it is permanently wetted. All of these pictures you see are of wildlife that were taken in the wetland. The second cell is an emergent wetland. It's patterned after emergent and scrub shrub wetland. So it's our uh, biggest cell. It's three, just shy of four acres, 116,000 cubic feet of water storage. What happens here is that you the water spreads out uh, you get a lot of um, surface area, shallow depths, and you get a lot of emergent plants that come up through that. Our objective there is nutrients, toxins, heavy metals, anything that might um, be attached to sediments that come through, that do make it through. A lot of the um, particulate, or excuse me, a lot of the uh, compounds that, um, a lot of the compounds that don't get removed in the waste water plant and or might be picked up, those endocrine disruptors, uh, we, we get a lot of um, sunlight and uh, are, are, are degraded in that fashion. Um, optimum filtration due to vegetation in this one, excellent migratory wetland habitat for birds and, and um, and uh, what are we, uh, amphibians of all kinds in there. Uh, cattails are harvested for craft work, or at least that's a proposal that we have. It's like a, a detention or retention pond in, in that it does uh, remove flood crests from uh, the surface water of the river adjacent to it. 
um, emergent plants, great bird and wildlife habitat, a lot of observation opportunities for um, wildlife viewing. Third cell, uh, just a little bit smaller than the second cell, is intended to be a palustrian emergent forested wetland. So you'll see here a lot more plantings along the banks. It's a narrower meandering channel. Um, whole idea there is that any additional solar radiation that might have been uh, incident in cell two, you give it a chance to cool back down here in cell three. So you're dosing it with your um, UV in cell two, then you're gonna try to uh, cool it back down. Um, so it's intended to treat temperature, not just from within the wetland process, but also uh, temperature related to um, warm stormwater events in the summer, but particularly so uh, warm effluent from the treatment facility. Uh, nutrients and toxins, endocrine disruptors as well. Uh, you get increased filtration time through this uh, meandering channel. Um, plus an emergent plants and habitat there. Canopy cover provides shade. Uh, we've got a lot of um, uh, wildlife viewed here as well. And the fourth cell, water storage, none. Really, it's just, a, as you can tell, it's got a pretty rapid flow through there. It's a cobbled channel, uh, mimics a forested stream channel. Any um, any lower oxygenated uh, waters that may occur either from groundwater seepage or through the slower placid flows in cells two and three get a chance to be re-aerated through that riffle. Um, today you'll see that this has got a lot more fines and sediments in here but it it still works pretty well during during higher flow events to, to oxygenate. So I want to talk about, I call it the CTW, the Constructed Treatment Wetland. Uh, initially, we've called it the stormwater wetland, the old town wetland, a number of things that stormwater was the primary uh, focus. Uh, once again, stormwater um, benefits or the influences of the wetland on stormwater is treatment. That's, I mean, that was the original driver. Solids and dissolved fractions are removed. Whoops back thank you there we go flow control and flood desynchronization um, we think the non-point improvements uh, in stormwater discharges help reduce the permitting pressure on our water and wastewater utilities as well um, public education and outreach this the utility uh, the wetland provides a real user interface um, you're seeing that uh, up front up close and personal Wastewater, the reclaimed water provides a seasonal wetland hydrology. So when we don't have the, uh, we have those, you know, those late spring and, and the occasional summer and early fall rains that come, those are treated. But apart from that, you're not getting saturated conditions um, simply by storm events. And so the reclaimed water and the backwash water from the water treatment plant also uh, help to provide that seasonal wetland hydrology. Uh, it's an adaptive management technique for effluent temperature control for reclaimed water. Uh, I have a slide on that, you'll see. Nutrient reduction, uh, uh, we meet our, um, our discharge limits in the wastewater plant. We have to do that by law, but additional nutrient removal happens through the emergent and um, scrub shub vegetation. Uh, I call that process polishing. So if it's a water quality improvement that's not necessary for uh, uh, that's not necessary for uh, uh, regulatory compliance, I call that polishing. So temperature uh, reductions, photodegradation of emerging contaminants, nutrient reduction, you basically get an improved product, if you will, as the water passes through there. Uh, water, as far as the water utility, um, the wetland helps make the backwash uh, not a waste, but a resource. 
Uh, it, the wetland provides a uh, location for groundwater recharge and stream flow augmentation. Um, through the use of the wetland, we're challenging conventional definitions of what consumptive and non-consumptive water use is from a water utility perspective. Uh, the wetland is going to, we believe, provide us water right mitigation opportunities. And uh, it provides, by keeping more water in the river, it's a sustainable tool for our, our citywide utility management. Public education and outreach, I put a block in specifically for this one, um, but it's an immersive, enriching experience. Uh, one slide, uh, the woman walking her dog in there, it's you, you, you step off of the urban area that is Arlington into this rural, um, uh, remote, even in a sense, um, uh, park that you walk, you're, you're outside of the, the urban area almost immediately. Uh, there's wildlife in there. There's flowing water in there. You, the views and the, and the, the atmosphere are um, enriching for sure. Uh, the, the whole site, the whole park that is developed around the wetland emphasizes high quality, one water value and stewardship concepts. It's unhosted, it's an open space park uh, providing river access and it uh, draws wildlife. Uh, we do have hosted activities there, bird watching, uh, school field trips are there, uh, scout volunteer um, opportunities, et cetera. What we'd like to try to do and haven't done yet in our first decade is establish an environmental education center at this location. So this slide, I want to um, talk. I want to talk um, just a little bit about some examples. This is um, ambient air temperature of summer 2018, and you can see that we got uh, on that riverbank with the parks and stuff nearby. We can get up over uh, 90 degrees easy. Um, it kind of bakes along the riverbank there. Um, the Water temperatures are well above the 18 degree, 17 to 18 degree water quality standards at peak time as they come into the reach from upstream. Uh, and our effluent discharges into that. And you can see that during the summer, our effluent is approaching uh, 24 degrees, pretty, pretty steady. So we have a chance uh, or a risk, I guess I should say, of increasing that temperature more than uh, 0 0.4 degrees C, which is our water quality limit, uh, what we would be allowed to do. Um, that's a big risk because we're not given a lot of buffer there. So one of the things we want to do is be able to discharge increasingly, especially during the summer periods, um, uh, reclamation facility effluent into the wetland to help cool that down. Um, here's an example of a study that we did uh, back in 2012 to 13 to 14, I believe. Um, and this, uh, this link, because uh, the slides will be made available, this link will get you to this report on this study. But we worked with the Stiligwamish Tribe, uh, Warm Beach Camp, and USGS to do a study of, of removal efficiencies for these um, pharmaceuticals, personal care products, et cetera, um, that have a um, endocrine disruption, or at least the potential for endocrine disruption effects. And so I won't try to explain that I know or pretend that I know many of these compounds, but they're showing the removal efficiencies uh, in different types of plants. Uh, we improved our, from 2009 uh, to 2011, that's when we improved our plant from a, what was then a sub, um, it's called a sequential batch reactor treatment process to a membrane bioreactor. Uh, that's what got us to the point where we were producing reclaimed water. And you can see in a lot of places, um, uh, the blue line is always shorter, in many cases at least, than the brown line, which is us. Uh, the other two are also, um, the green and the tan color are also 
uh, membrane bioreactor plants. But our removal efficiencies in some cases are very high, almost complete. In other cases, our removal efficiencies leave something to be desired. The treatment plants really aren't designed to remove those um, compounds, uh, and therefore they are being you know, passed through. But that's where we think um, with the uh, photodegradation uh, provided by UV in the wetland that we'll get further reductions in those. Uh, this is a part of a study that we did on groundwater in the wetland. There's a, the wetland here. And it basically shows uh, dominant flow paths during base flow events, during a couple of storm tails uh, where the river passed by, crest passed by and started to, to fall again. And this one is during a, pre uh, a peak event. What you see as, as the storm comes by in flood events only, this is when the river floods, you can get a um, uh, groundwater gradient away from the river, away from the wetland off into the floodplain. Um, but then immediately after that crest passes, so a very short time, less than 10% of the flows, it's going to reverse direction almost 180 degrees and that water is going to run back off into the river and not just surface runoff but base flow or excuse me uh, groundwater seepage back in and then with further uh, lowering of the water table the flow direction starts to equilibrate back downstream parallel to the river and what this is showing you is that um, what you get in uh, infiltration for most of the localized storm events is not just happening in the wetland and going, you know, 200 feet to the river. It's going for hundreds of feet, thousands of feet downriver before it ever hits um, the river. So you're getting a lot more additional contaminant removal through that process, a lot more um, base flow. Uh, production where this water is then available to seep back into the river. Took us uh, 1.3 million to do the construction. We had a couple of grants and matched that with our capital funds uh, out of our stormwater funding. Um, uh, we had tons of volunteers, hundreds of hours, and that's what this is showing part of the planting uh, that was going on there. And this is in the center between uh, cells two, this is near the start of cell two, and cell three. So um, a lot of work was in there. Uh, it's today a vibrant ecosystem. We've got osprey in a nest that come back every single year. Very neat to watch. Herons and deer and frogs, and garter snakes and insects and ducks and crayfish and I'm going to let Bill tell you this one, sculpin or a small fish. And I wanted to make a point here about vegetation establishment. It makes all the difference in the world. And all of my pictures, so you could see um, what's going on here, are taken. Some of these are the earlier ones, right? So what you're going to see here is cell one, cell two, Cell three comes back through here. This is the forested one. And then this is the riffle back down through here. We've got a trail network with footbridges in here. Uh, those couple of fountains is when we were um, irrigating. At one point we tried, we did some irrigation up on the banks. Eventually we just basically um, did flood irrigation in the middle of, especially in the emergent and forested um, meanders over here. But uh, we did, that's what that was, trying to get cooler aerated water into the, uh, into the channel. There's a old irrigation well there in that building. So this is a little bit later, you start to see it come up, but not fast, it's not fast and furious. But then with time, here's a picture that was taken just a couple of, couple of years ago, maybe one and a half years ago, it makes all the difference. Here is a Google Earth image 2018. You can start to see where it's really coming in. It's really started to come since then. And that's me. However, we're not done yet. So if anybody was, um, if there's any questions to this point, I'd be happy to entertain them. 
but I um, I want to rewind and talk in a little bit more detail even about some of the, the features that we've talked about and explain a little bit further why, how this integration happens. So I'm going to pause just for a second and because I can't see the Q&A box. Yeah, so Mike. See anything in the chat. I just want to make sure that, are there any questions to date up to this point? Right now, Mike, I don't see any. Um, as a reminder okay. to attendees, um, in the attendees tab of your toolbar, there's a little hand you can raise and we can unmute you to ask a question if you've got one at this time. Um, and let's see if one, I think I just saw one get raised here. Yep, so there is one here, Rob. I'm gonna unmute you if you'd like to ask Mike a question. Um, go ahead and ask away. Okay, great, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, I can. Okay. Awesome. Hey, Mike, this is a really cool project. Um, I'm curious, the land that the wetland is on, what was the ownership of and management of that before um, y'all installed the wetland? I I will show you a picture. It was a former dairy. Um, the city purchased it for the purposes of stormwater and utility management back in the late 90s, 90, I, it was, the process started in the late 90s. I think it actually uh, was completed, the purchase was completed in 2000. Uh, it took us, you know, most, uh, we sat on our hands, I think for a little while, and then, um, and we, you know, basically leased that field for haying and stuff to local farmers until about 2007. Then we started pretty intensively with the design finally went to construction in 2010, 2011. So it's a, it's a former pasture. Uh, you'll see a couple of barns in these pictures that were dairy barns. Um, and there's a roundhouse that the farmer constructed after he was retired. That's pretty impressive. And I think you'll see a picture of that in here also. But, and I have some pictures that I'll, I'll get in to do that and show you. Great. So I'm I at this point, what I did is I, I wanted to do my uh, presentation. I took a little longer on it than I had in an earlier one. Um, and then now I'm I'm gonna backpedal just a little bit, show some more details. But if there's any questions, please don't hesitate to ask at this point because I'd much rather ask you answer your questions or address specific thoughts of yours. It does look like we have a couple more questions, Mike. Okay. Um, yeah, so so a question of how many acres does it treat for stormwater? I think that was in regards to what you were just chatting with. Oh, and I, I apologize. It's uh, the whole parcel uh, was about 20 acres. We took about 10, um, between eight and 10, uh, to actually do the wetland construction. Uh, just shy of eight is inside the, you know, the, the berms around the wetland. Hey Mike, how many acres of upland paved air and stormwater and parking lots does, does the system treat? Thank you, Bill. What a great segue. So in this thing, I'm going to put a little coarse polygon around the wetland. This part, this north end, of Arlington, Arlington's umpteen square miles, you know, a handful of square miles, and this is a couple. This was about 280 acres of Old Town Arlington that from that story I told at the very beginning had untreated discharge to the river. It was the largest untreated discharge. And here's one, you can see where it was going untreated. And instead of going to the river, we've got it going to the well. And, and um, here's a couple of bullets on this, Bill. Let me see if I can do this. So our, the old town, Arlington, sits on an outcrop, if you will, of runoff generating glacial till. So we get a little bit of infiltration and in pockets in there, but a lot of it's just run runoff. And at 280 acres, it was the largest sub-basin of untreated stormwater discharge in Arlington until the construction of the wetland. And as we said, it's it it's it's like a, a detention pond or a rain garden on steroids. I mean, that might be a dumb analogy, but that's it's it really um, 
is that was our objective as we put some thought into it. We do have at the north end of town uh, two other basins, 70 acres over here, eight acres right here in the middle of the, but most of this uh, 280 acres goes to the wetland. And um, Arlington, here's a couple. Go ahead. Okay, there's a question from David Jackson in the questions box um, asking, can you talk more about how to size the wetland and what the stormwater jet analysis done as part of it? I am so sorry. I, that was garbled and I had trouble hearing that. Hey, that's okay. We were just, um, Stephanie, your connection for some reason is a little patchy there. Um, but she was saying whether, um, if you could talk to how the sizing of the wetland took place. Um, how that was done and and was a storm water uh, storm watershed analysis done as part of that process yes yes um we uh retained a consultant um <sighs> and the name just went out the door we we retained landau associates uh we retained landau associates they um had a team of of engineers and biologists and work closely with our city staff to um with the construction they heard us they heard uh the the, the vision and the concepts and they put meat on the bones um they i can't tell you the name of the model that they ran but it was a modeled system make sure that we understood exactly what we would and would not treat it does treat um I'm sorry, I clicked accidentally. It, uh, we did treat, we did model for the six month storm event in terms of water quality. Um, and that's where we're getting most of, of the benefit there in terms of a stormwater um, benefit. But it also had volume for a hundred year. Um, so, into, but it started to move pretty quickly through the system. So, but even with that, you had, uh, and I don't remember the length of the channel if you tried to straighten things out, but um, you've got thousands of feet of channel in there because of the meander length. Great, those are the questions we have for now. Okay. So, and then I had a comment in here, much of Arlington benefits from infiltration of stormwater and glacial outwashed soils. That's as the city grew to the south and west, uh, we're in the Marysville trough, uh, just east of highway of I-5 as you come past I, um, Arlington. And we get lots of infiltration. And despite the benefits, I wrote this, uh, despite the benefits of infiltration to the city, this other infrastructure doesn't provide the huge benefits of habitat, recreation, stormwater, natural resources, outreach, and education that's unique to the wetland. So, uh, the wetland is is what really speaks volumes when uh, you know we do a good job we think with stormwater across the city but this is like a jewel for us it really has a big benefit of of people seeing the treatment concept and understanding um uh, green construction uh, concepts um i i ended in here arlington is no combined sewer outfall. So when you hear about other older municipalities um, that have those issues, um, for example, or Seattle and Everett and a lot of the, the larger older cities still have trouble with those. But because of our uh, the way we divided things back up early on, 30s, 50s, and then with our uh, treatment um, in 70s and 90s, uh, we're blessed to have no CSOs. Drinking water, um, we have a well field at the north end on Haller, the airport, the PUD, we do get some of the regional supply that, there. Um, about 80%, about 10%, 10% is what it gets. Most of our water comes from the river or adjacent to the river. And, because it's from the river and it's got a river influence, we have to treat it just like it's surface water. So it's unlike groundwater, we have to 
do a lot of effort to make sure that we're removing bacteria and viruses. And so th that filter training that you saw there has got a lot of uh, uh, anthocyte and sand, silica sand in it, and it filters um, uh, sediment out of it. Even though it looks brand spanking clean coming into it, it it's got stuff in it. Every so often we have to backwash and we, we um, that includes an aeration. This is an air scour that just is, can make it look like chocolate milk. And then it starts to pour over in these troughs and then it starts to clean itself out and this drains out to, um, to discharge. Uh, most of the sediment fraction is goes to our wastewater plant and is treated there and becomes reclaimed water. The more than half of it, though, is perfectly clean. It's um, it's uh, dechlorinated and uh, is discharged to um, the wetland like this. So that becomes a, a irrigation source, if you will. Um, and then our water reclamation utility, conventional sewer collection, but instead of becoming effluent, it becomes reclaimed water. There are 600 water uh, wastewater plants in the Washington state, but there's only 30 reclamation facilities. They've got classes, quality classes like A, B, C, D. Arlington sends class B to the river, class A to the wetland. Um, the only distinction there is how much UV uh, you shoot into it for virus uh, removal or to guarantee virus removal. So uh, we do a pretty good job at it. I got some, this is 2019, that's the most recent year recognized. A number of facilities in Snohomish County do good, but if you look down this list, we're the only one listed here that's a, um, uh, except for Warm Beach, Warm Beach should be recognized as reclamation also. Um, reclaimed water reuse. This is actually not reclaimed water, but it's a it's a dye study that we're doing, and it shows the outfall is in the thaw leg of the river, and because we have to have them well mixed, we're not allowed to have any fraction of our mixing zone or outside the mixing zone exceed water quality standards. And so this was part of a dye study that was helping us quantify mixing, but it kind of shows you um, the concept. Basically, if you're putting water that's as clean or cleaner uh, as the river, uh, and it's the river water that you just took out just 400 feet upstream, uh, you can kind of see that um, we're augmenting it well, basically with the same, same supply. Um, and I mentioned this earlier, this is the, the treatment system, but you've got this groundwater, this extended uh, base flow augmentation. So not just direct discharge to the channel itself, surface water, but you get a lot of groundwater uh, enhancement through recharge and base flow um, discharge to the river. Uh, our utilities, this is a combination of our water and wastewater operations. Uh, you look at these, um, and during the winter and spring and fall, um, we are actually augmenting the river. And, and this may not be exactly, this is a little older data, but here's three years worth of data that shows that there is uh, the river discharge. And if you modified the river discharge either by taking out or adding back in, flows that were germane to your utility operations, um, we either augmented up to one CFS, maybe at the most one and a half to two. And then during the summer flows, um, down to two CFS, we would have a hit on the river. But at this point, the lowest flows in the summer are um, uh, on an extreme low flow, 180, 200 CFS, but frequently will be in the order of 1,000 CFS. And I, I added there, that data is, again, that's background scatter. There's the median and the monthly maximum differences. And so as you get 
water discharge that you take out of the Stiligwamish Basin back into it 400 feet away, as well as foreign flows that might come from our PUD uh, regional supply. Uh, you do get some I and I where we're actually getting leakage into um, uh, the wastewater system, groundwater seepage into it. But basically, it is um, exceeding our withdrawals at the river um, during the summer for periods of 55 to 73 days. In these three years, um, we actually can uh, impact by most usually by less than a CFS, basically not detectable. Um, up to a couple CFS. Again, not detectable on a river the size of the Stellarwamish, um, except by modeling. <laughs> so, um, and here is an example of, I wanna bring this up because if you've heard of this Yelm and the Yelm versus Foster court case, it's uh, uh, akin to the Hearst uh, court case that uh, addressed um, uh, permit exempt wells. But this is, um, basically, our Haller Wellfield water rights applied to our consumption, our typical monthly consumption pattern. So you see uh, a lot more consumption, a third more at least in the summer. Uh, you've got a year-round base amount for domestic and um, commercial uses, and you get this, series, this seasonal increase here. But our water rights basically um, by the time we add in different water rights uh, including some irrigation water rights that we acquired you start to see that with the water right portfolio and with the in-stream flows established that we have access to water in the summer because we have um, uh, a fair sized water right for the year-round use um, but we also have some irrigation rights that we've added in but after those irrigation rights are used in the fall period here um, you can get some risk of being interrupted when stream flows go below um, go below the minimum established flows for minimum and stream flows um, our we're senior uh, to a certain extent at least during the summer yeah um, um, five but, minutes mike just a heads up Okay, I got it, thanks. And so, um, but what you're seeing here is that of those 100, I don't, what I basically, I, I took all of our water and I put it into 300 to 450 acre feet per month that we would be using. But it's these areas just outside of the peak season called the shoulder season that Yelm, that started the Foster uh, court case when they said that, wait a minute, you're impairing, impacting stream flows um, in these late spring and early fall periods when you still have low flows in the, in the river, uh, in the waters of the, of the state, but what do I wanna say there? You, you still have the, you've got these limiting periods and by the time this is a percentage of the flows that are um, subject to in-stream flows. So during the summer, you, most everything that you've got in the river is below in-stream flows. In off season, in winter, in spring and late fall, much of the flows are not uh, in, affected at all by in-stream flows. So uh, basically taking a, a frequency analysis, this is where we have trouble. And this is where the big benefit of the um, wetland comes in. We have backwash, it's not a waste, but a resource. Same with the redeemed water, providing a source for hydrology. I'm repeating these again, the polishing of, of different water quality concerns. Um, we're no longer a truly consumptive water utility in many ways, because the juxtaposition, that adjacency of the water and wastewater plants um, do a lot of concurrent and offsetting processes, but the wetland is what integrates them and helps us. So when we're putting that, that base flow back in the wetland, we're getting that opportunity to mitigate and address those shoulder season flows uh, that were concerned for Yelm and look to be a concern for the city of Arlington. 
and a couple of do-overs. We budgeted for vegetative maintenance, including some replacement plantings and stuff that was under part of the contract. But I'm thinking we probably should have done some additional planning. Um, uh, maintenance is a big job. Uh, kind of overtook us, I think, for a while there. Um, so the more you can do opportunities for volunteers, great. Um, our irrigation system was not effective from the start. We had some pump failures. It resulted, I think that was part of our early vegetation mortality and moisture stress. And we didn't get, I don't think, as good of a jump on our vegetation plantings as we could have. And therefore we had some competition with invasives. Um, the weirs were concrete weirs and we kind of wanted to make some minor changes to them, tweak them a little bit. We added planks and it worked okay, but uh, anything that you can do to help make weir elevations and control the water levels in your cells, uh, that's the better, you're better for it. Uh, budget more for hydrologic and water quality monitoring, we did, but when you want to buy $200 of, of sensors and you don't, um, it comes back to bite. So it's well worth the effort to help understand your system earlier. Um, and then David Jackson, Snohomish Conservation District last fall did a um, review uh, of the system for us because we know that we were behind on our maintenance. He's got some recommendations, none of them I don't think which were surprising to us, but I just wanted you to see that conservation districts have a place in uh, a lot of insight into the, the management and the maintenance of systems like this. Clearing sediment, we know that we're are about to do that this, this summer, remove um, our first ever dredging of cell one. Uh, we've got some uh, reed canary grass, I think mixed in with some other grasses, but we also have got uh, nightshade and uh, blackberries and, and whatever in there. So. What David is suggesting is that we get in there, uh, remove and mow, and then get some additional smaller uh, shrub species in there, some willow stakes to help with the uh, shade out uh, canary grass. And then uh, we did have a lot of blackberry come in along that, um, along that margin uh, between the river and the wetland. And we're finally taking that back out now. That's what I've got. If there's any other questions, I'd be happy to answer those. We have probably about a minute left for questions. Okay. So if you've got a question for um, Mike, feel free to raise your hand or put it in the questions box. Um, and also if for some reason we have questions that um, don't get answered, um, Mike, would I, I, you available? I will be on morning? for the morning, so if there's, for sure. So if okay. there's anything else that comes back up, I'd be happy to, and I'd be happy to make everything available, presentations available. Um, Excellent, great. For dispersal. Uh, I do wanna say your very own Bill Blake is the brainchild behind um, this entire project. And so if I can't answer questions, uh, talk to Bill. He has a lot of insight. He was, uh, we worked together on this, but he was he was the mover and the shaker behind it. Uh, and it is a, basically a legacy to his, his visionary skills and his uh, work ethic and uh, stewardship ethic. So, That's yeah. thank you, Bill. You're the smart guy, Mike. You, you made it all work. <laughs> That's oh, wonderful. I got the yeah, water flowing you, downhill. <laughs> So I'm going to sh release yes, my sharing, great. right? <laughs> Thank you Thank so you much Mike. for your time, Mike.